you get your Bible, once you have that in your hand, turn, we're now in Exodus chapter 21. We're going to begin the chapter 21. We are not going to finish chapter 21, though. Uh, you know, chapter 21 all the way through chapter 23 contains many laws or those things that now God gives to Moses to bring to the children of Israel. And he's going to speak about how you are to judge these different things as they occur. There's a wide variety of them that he touches on, by the way, including, uh, I want to say, employment, right? Treatment of slaves, treatment of servants, treatment of those slaves out there. I call it employment, and you'll see why a little later. Uh, protecting that person, protection for the person. What you're going to see in all these is there's a protection individually for, those, for each individual person. He's going to speak about murder and how they're to judge murder or manslaughter, depending on what it is, you know whether it is uh, a murder that was intentional or something happened by accident, violent assaults, those type of things, there again, for protection of the person. The liability that you may gain, you know, uh, liability as like, well, insurance liability, I guess you could say. Animals that you own that you're responsible for and maybe they hurt somebody. What's your liability there? There again, to protect the person, to protect both sides, too. The one that owns the animal and the one that gets hurt by the animal. It's going to go into theft and responsibility of restitution there. All these laws, all the laws of society to protect each person. That's what laws are all about. You know? That's why we have laws, is that each individual is judged upon them laws, and everybody plays on the same board. Unfortunately, we kind of live in a lawless land right now, right? It's kind of sad. You see all these things that take place, all these murders that take place. Guys, if Jesus isn't coming back soon, I don't know what's going on. It is getting out of control. Lawlessness, he said, will abound. It is abounding. When you can go into the store and steal up to $900 and walk out and there's no prosecution, there's some kind of problem there, don't you think? If you need to do that, Josh, go to California. You can do that. Up to, up, I think it's up to 1900 and something. You can walk in, steal it, and they won't prosecute you. You can walk out. Literally, these stores are shutting down because of that. You know who's actually leaving? The most liberal company out there, Starbucks. Starbucks is leaving San Francisco. Starbucks, they're leaving San Francisco. Why? Because of the lawlessness there. They can't have their employees there anymore. The fact is, people are getting mugged and hurt and robbed. Anyway, theft and responsibility of the restitution. He's going to speak about rape and dowries. You guys know what a dowry is? Everybody should know what a dowry is. Probably in your day, Faye, you had to pay a dowry, huh? To, 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 to marry that bride. Somebody had to give your daddy the money for you. Anyway, speaks about the value of a virgin, all for the protection of the individual. I keep bringing that up. The treatment of the poor, how you're to treat the very, and value the very least of those, right? All those things God brings into his laws, plus a lot more. And all for what? Protection of the individual. God is looking at each individual. You know, the laws of the land there that, these, that they will be under is going to show that. It's going to show the value of the person, that human life is valuable. Amen? We know that. Human life is valuable. Laws that regulate society, and that's why we have laws still today. Each individual being important and held within those laws. You know, a human life, is important to God. Each and every human life is important, and we should know that, whether they're a child, whether they're an adult, whether they're slaves, whether they're free. You know, you guys think about it. Uh, you think, well, slavery, that's long gone. No, it's not. Most nations still have slavery. All the Africa uh, nations, that uh, continent of Africa, there's slavery there. In uh, Egypt, there's slavery. In Iran, there's slavery. 
in all, most Mideastern countries, there's slavery. In China, there's slavery. All throughout, there is still slavery through, through the world. It's not been abolished by any means, but God's going to lay out these laws in Exodus for the Jewish people because all are important. See, Genesis 127, go all the way back there. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He's a, they're in the image of God. Each human being is the image of God, and that's why they're important. Each is important, and each is protected by those laws that he lays down. Now, you know, as we go through here in some of this study, you'll think, well, wow, this seems really out of line that God would actually call this out in his lines, in, in, in his laws, I'm sorry. It's kind of out of line. You know, slaves, wait a minute. Daughters who are sold, that type of thing. We get the wrong view. You know, we look at it and we go, well, this isn't right. This isn't right. It's wrong in our view, basically, is what I'm saying. Yet you have to take it in the light of the times, right? You know, that's one thing important to always remember. You, I, people before us, they were born in a time they didn't create. Did you create the culture when you were born? They were born in a culture they didn't create, in a time they didn't create, having nothing, no control over any of that, right? No control over that. Question is, is what do you do in that time, though? Now that you're there and you're in that time and you see an injustice and it's not biblically backed up, now you stand for what is true and what is right. Amen? We see that with our forefathers. They were born in a time and they were living and established our country in a time when slavery was, was known, right? And what did they do? They abolished it. They knew what God's word said and so they got rid of it. But these laws that govern the society and give the rights to the individual, like I say, whether they're slave, free, male, female, poor, rich. In Galatians 3.28, we see it in the New Testament too, where Paul writes, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Basically, you're made in the image of God. Now, I want to make a note here. A lot of people think and a lot of people have accused the Bible as being responsible for slavery by what is said here. That the Bible, God's word is responsible for slavery. It's the opposite is true. God literally, the Bible is responsible for the elimination of slavery. And that's kind of what I'm going to show you here as he speaks and he protects each person, even slaves. He did not establish, the Bible did not establish slavery. Slavery had been along for a long, long time before the Jews, Jewish people, before Israel. Guess what? Who were they held enslaved to? Egypt, right? And so it had been going on for a long time before them. God's word now is going to give protection, protection for all the different people, right? It's going to give guidelines on how to treat those that are what you would call servants or slaves. By the way, you know, in the New King James and much of the translation of the Bible, where it says servant a lot in the New Testament, in the original translation, it normally said slave or bond slave, one of the two. It didn't use servant. But the fact is, when, when these were translated out, the word slave was pretty harsh, and so they just took it out of there. But... Um, like I say, slavery was present long before, long before these laws even came about. And these laws are helped to abolish and protect those slaves. Like I say, our forefathers knew that. Our forefathers knew the word of God. And that's why things changed. America is actually one of the only nations that slavery was within and then it was abolished within, was wiped out. Amen? Let's pray. Father God... I want to thank you, Lord, as we study your word tonight. Father, that you will uh, reveal in your word. Teach us tonight, Lord, through the Old Testament in the time of Moses, way back in the book of Exodus. Lord, bless the reading of your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my message tonight is simply, and I've said it many times here, protection for all, right? That's kind of what we're going to see here. 
chapter 21, verse 1. It says, now these are the judgments, God said, these are the judgments which you shall set before them. These are the judgment. These are the laws. These are the regulations. This is how it's to be regulated for a just society. These are the judgments, the laws that will be set before the people. The judges will oversee and, 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 uh, and, and judge each case individually upon what God says right here, right? Now, it's protection for all. You remember back there, look back at Exodus 18 real quick. Remember back there, good old Jethro, right? He came and he helped set this up, these judges. In chapter 18 there, in verse 19, uh, Jethro came and told, and told Moses, listen now to my voice. I will give you a counsel and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people so that you may, you may uh, bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able, able men such as to fear God. These are the judges, you see, that he set up there way back in chapter 18 here. Thank God for his father-in-law coming along. And so all these judges are going to judge upon these laws and the way God puts them down here. Like I say, it'll be uh, protection for each and every individual. In Galatians 3.28, I want to read that again. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. God is not a respecter of people. God is not a respecter of person. God is impartial in all ways. God doesn't love me any more than he loves you. He doesn't love me any more than he loves the poor addict that's down in the ditch right now with a needle in their arm. God loves all, and he wants protection for all, and this is the way the laws are laid out. Go into verse 2 now. He says, if you buy a Hebrew servant, this is really interesting, right? What is the first thing God's going to speak about? Slavery. Where did he just bring him out of? Slavery. I am the Lord your God, and I brought you. Out. I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. I am the one who brought you out of bondage. What's the first thing you're going to speak about? Hey, you guys were in slavery, right? And so I'm going to speak about slavery first and what you're to do because they'd just been there. He says, If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh, he shall go, uh, he shall go out free and pay nothing, right? And if he uh, comes in by himself, he should go out by himself. Then if he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife, right? Basically, he's brought a wife in for, bought another, what we would call a slave, right? But not really a slave, and I'm going to show you here. If he's bought him a wife, um, him a wife, and she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her, be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. Well, that doesn't seem right. That's his wife. Hang on a minute here, all right? Hang on a minute. You know, in ancient Israel, ancient Israel, people would be bought working for others, right? They're bought. They're bought as slaves, right? And it was a principle that's set up, and I don't want to use it, but I'm going to use the word servanthood, okay? They were bought, these slaves in a sense, but not as you might think, not as the slave traders did back in the time, uh, you know, before before America was established, the slave traders, right? And they would they would go in there and and basically kidnap these people and sell them and vicious to them. No, it wasn't that way back then. I want to read something here from Spurgeon. Moses did not institute slavery in any shape. The laws concerning it were made on a purpose to repress it, you see. It was to repress it, to confine it within a very narrow, narrow bounds and ultimately to put it to an end. Now, there are basically four ways. Four ways you could become a slave or a servant to a master. Number one, believe it or not, was extreme poverty. 
You were down and out. You were homeless. You would sell yourself. You would go be a slave unto a master so that your needs were provided. You'd have a place to live. You would have food to eat. He was now your master under extreme poverty. You'd sell your liberty, your freedom to survive. Time to get back on your feet. What did it say? Six years, right? For six years, you'd work for that guy. Think about it. If you were homeless, and in six years now, you got a little something. Many times, the masters would say, okay, you know what? I'm going to give you a few sheep. I'm going to give you this, whatever it is. Another way was for, and you're going to think this is terrible too, for a father to sell his daughter. Well, we wouldn't think that's, you know, that's terrible today. The daughter was sold, basically, to be eventually in marriage, either to that master or maybe to one of the master's son. They would work in the home. They were treated well. They were, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a matter of, you know, they're getting whipped or something. No, they were treated well. And the third might be a case of bankruptcy. You lost everything you had, right? You're a servant to the creditor. Suddenly, you become a slave to that one because you owe them money. And so now you have to work it off and pay off your debt. By the way, the Bible says, Proverbs 22, 7, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrow is a servant to the lender. A slave, guys, a slave to the lender. Why do you want to be debt-free? I'll tell you why you want to be debt-free. Because otherwise, you are a slave to that lender, and that's a way they would have to pay them off sometimes. The fourth would be possibly if you were a thief, right? And you stole, and now you're, you're unable to pay it back, and so there's a restitution that you would have to pay, and you're basically going to work off your restitution with that guy, you know? Pay off that debt because you stole. There's, those are four different ways. See, practice of slavery in the Old Testament was not like we might think because we compare it to those movies and things we hear, right? Sometimes, and it was literally chosen. It was a mutual agreement between two. I will be your servant. I will be your slave. A mutual agreement, and sometimes a lifelong. We're going to see in here where it could be a lifelong job working for that one. You literally get a pension at the end. Right? Think about it today. You work a job for however many years and you get a pension at the end. Well, at the end there, you know, you, he set you up in a house. You got a little piece of land. Your master set you up, you know. Sometimes it'd be for a limited duration, obviously, just to get yourself ahead. Those six years give you a chance to get ahead. And they would, they would literally become those slaves. Um, like I say, agreed upon uh, mutual agreement for six years. And note, as we get to the rest of these, we're going to see that everything else is highly regulated for the master and the slave. It's to protect the person. Like I say, God had just brought them out of slavery, and so he wanted to give them the proper way to have a servant. Because the way they were treated in Egypt was not the proper way to be treating a servant or a slave. In verse 3 now, if he comes in by himself, speaking about a man, and he shall go out by himself, if he comes in married, that he, his wife shall go over out with him. If his master has given him a wife, though, and she's born in some children, shall be her master's, and he shall go out by himself. Wait a minute, that's, that's cruel, that's terrible. Well, he left with what he came, right? It was just, it was honest. If he came with a wife and he, came, and he had children or came with children, that's what he left with. I imagine possessions. He would leave with the possessions he had attained also. The man could redeem the wife by buying them, paying the price, right? This man has something invested. So it was just, he could redeem his wife, he could redeem his children, or... They could do their six years, and then they were free to go, you see, too. They'd made their obligation. It's not that they would never be free. Each would fulfill their obligation towards the master according to this six years. 
Remember Jacob and Laban? You remember how Jacob, he wanted to marry Rachel so bad, and he was going to give Laban seven years, and Laban tricked him and got him old lazy eye Leah. Remember that? And then he had to work another seven years to get Rachel, you know? Well, that's what it was. It was an arrangement that was made. You know, Jacob wasn't treated harshly. He had a place to live. You know, he had food. It's not like he was thrown down in some dungeon and had to labor. In verse 5 now, but if the servant plainly says, I love my master, uh, my wife and my children, and I will not go out from here. I will not go out free. Then the master shall bring him to the judges, and he shall also bring him to the door and to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him now forever. Hey, he just made a lifetime agreement. He says, you know what? I'm going to get my retirement here too. I'm going to take care of my family this way. Mm. God, like I say, God, he would... They'd get the opportunity. You know, God's law was so it would be right for the, for the servant or, the, or that personhood or that slave. And he could say, I love my master, right? It's kind of the same for us. Think about it. We're to be bond servants, bond slaves under Jesus Christ. We can choose to serve Jesus for a lifetime. Maybe we'll just give him six years. How about that? I'm going to give him your six years and I'll be done. Got my six years in, Jesus. I'm done. No. Or a lifetime. For a little while or for life. And what did he do? He'd, he'd pierce their ear, right? He'd take it all and pierce that slave's ear. And now he's a bond servant for life. A willing servant is what a bond servant is. You know, Paul said in Galatians 2, 20, I love this scripture, guys. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of Man who loved me and gave himself for me. I crucified with Christ. I was pierced with Christ, right? You kind of choose. Are you going to serve Jesus for a life? Will, are you going to get your ear pierced or not? Are you going to be crucified or not? Are you going to serve Jesus? In verse 7 now, we move on. And if a man sells his daughter to be a female slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. So in other words, six years, no. All right? If he sells this daughter, basically the daughter's... Well, read on here. You'll see it. And if she does not please her master then, who has betrothed her, who's going to marry her to himself then he shall let her be redeemed. can be bought back, right? He shall have no right to sell her to the foreign people. No, you're not going to sell them to some foreign people, right? And basically take her out of that bloodline since he has dealt deceitfully with her. And if he has betrothed her to his son, he shall deal with her according to the custom of the daughters. And we'll read about that later. He'll treat her like his own daughter, Right? He's going to treat her well. And if he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, and her mar marital rights. No, you're not going to take any of that. Even though he marries another, they had multiple wives, this one is going to be taken care of. And if he does not do these three, those three things for her, then she shall go out free without paying money. You see, what did the master have to do? He had to be an honest man. He had to take care of things. God was protecting the person. Protection for all. The master just couldn't do anything he wanted. Like I say, verse 7 through 11, it refers to that selling a girl into marriage. And we go, whoa, wow, man. This too seems wrong in our times. You know, we might think, that's a weird way to be given to marriage. But the girl was protected too. You understand? You got to take things in their times. Things change. Things change for that girl. Hey, he doesn't take care of her properly. And guess what? The father can redeem her. Or if he doesn't take care of her properly once he's married her to the son, she can walk free. You see, it wasn't, it wasn't like we might think it would be. Yeah, it's different. You know? 
I didn't sell my daughters out to marriage, you know. I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't get money for them, obviously. They cost me a lot of money, though, you know, you think about it. Uh, get, get something back, maybe. Go on to verse 9 here. And it says there, Oh, I'm sorry. And if he is betrothed her to his son, he shall deal with her according to the custom of the daughters. And if he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food or clothing or marriage or marital rights or anything. See, basically, she's going to be cared for. She's going to be protected as a person. She will be protected in those ways, and God's law will ensure it. Because why? She is in the image of God, too, male and female. God created man and woman in his image. In verse 11, if the deal's broken, you set him free, man. All will be accountable, even this master. See, th these laws that we are reading here for the Jewish people and the cultures in the time, they literally was revolutionary. It was revolutionary because the people, this, this they'd never heard before. The master could do anything the master wanted to do. There was no consequences for what he wanted to do. And so this was revolutionary because God was protecting each and every individual. Now we're going to see laws that regard to violence and, and disabilities that may be imposed, right? Somebody hurts you. They hurt you bad. And what's going to happen there? In verse 12 now, he who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. Boom. There you go. You struck a man, you killed, you didn't kill, you murdered a man. That will be put to death. However, if he did not lie in, in wait, but God delivered him into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place where he may flee. I'll speak about that in a minute. But if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar that he may die, it says there. You know, this is where we get the principle, many places in the Bible, we get the principle of the death penalty, right? Personally, I have no problem uh, with the death penalty, and many states have abolished it. It's not like I'm about killing people, but you got to go back to Genesis, right? Back to Genesis 9, 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For the image of God he made man. You see, God has, oh, well, God's ordained the death penalty for murder, for murder. If it's an accident, uh, if it's manslaughter, they said, you know, but if it's intentional, if it is premeditated murder, we've seen a lot of premeditated murder lately. It's so sad, man. I've been praying for those people over there and why it's going on. It's going on in those Asian Communities, too, which is rather odd. You know, these, uh, a dance studio of all places. You know, there are Asian comes in there and starts shooting. It's so sad, guys. And, <sighs> Jesus, Maranatha, return quickly is all I can say. You know, the New Testament also st kind of states this. Uh, the right for the state or the government to institute a death penalty uh, it's in Romans 13, to use a sword. In Romans 13, 3 through 4, for rulers are not the terror to good works, but to evil. <laughs> I don't know if I want to say anything about that right now or not. Things have changed. It, it, but he says here, for rulers are not the terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good. And you will have praise from the same. In verse 4, it says, For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, meaning he can take your life. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. You know, for so many, uh, many get away with murder. You know what I mean? within the system. God's going to be the ultimate judge, is he not, though? Man is to live 
by the laws that God has set forth there's always going to be those who are able to squirrel around it, I guess you would say, right? You don't see justice. Let's move on. Verse 12. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. However, if he did not lie in wait, but God delivered him into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place where he may flee, he says. So God is telling these judges, look for this. Is it premeditated or is it not? Look for this. Each of these judges, the judges of tens and hundreds and thousands, as it said back there in chapter 18, look for that. If not, I'll, play, I'll give me a place for him to flee for a while. Now, we'll later on, we'll, that's going to be way later on, if we look in the book of Numbers or we go all the way to Joshua, you see there were these what you call sanctuary cities. So if somebody killed somebody, you know, um, ran them over with their camel, right, <laughs> or whatever it was, ran them over, didn't really mean to do it, whole family's up in a roar, they're going to kill this guy for killing this guy, they could go to a sanctuary city. But at this time, there was actually an altar, and they would run and grab a hold of the horns on the altar, on the altar, and you were not able to touch them there. This place they would flee that God speaks. He says that, uh, for you, a place where he may flee. And this is the place they'd flee to. And they grab a hold of the horns on the altar. And God would protect them there if they weren't, uh, if they weren't a murderer, if they weren't guilty, basically. Otherwise, he says, you can take them from there. He says, but if a man acts premeditated against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you shall take him, right, from my altar. So the judges had to make this judgment. They had to look at the situation and go, was this premeditated or was it not? In verse 15, he says, now he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Just striking him, slapping him across the face, no, go back to verse 12, right? What does it say there? Strike. He who strikes a man so that he dies. So what they're speaking about is he who kills their parent, right, shall surely be put to death. He who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death, right? Those that kidnap. He who, uh, and he who curses his father or his mother, kind of separated these. This is kind of interesting. And he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death also. Wow, a lot of putting to death there, right? But like I say, in verse 15, where it talks about those parents and striking, that is to, to kill them. You know, we all seek see capital punishment for kidnapping. Those taking somebody against their will. Kidnapping a man... Um, selling them, basically, right? Capital punishment for selling a person. You know, there needs to be a lot of, a lot of prosecution and a lot of people put to death for selling people. And you know what I'm talking about, the sex trafficking. It is incredible and huge within our nation. And the worst part is they're children. I don't know about you guys, I got no problem with saying off with their heads, each and every one of them. Oh, I might be a pastor, but I think we should go by by God's word here. You're going to kidnap somebody and you're going to sell them for a profit, off with your head. Amen? <sighs> those who hurt children, those who come against children. You know, verse 17 there, when we look at that, and it says, and he who curses his father or mother shall surely be put to death. You remember the fifth commandment, right? Fifth commandment is honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord God is giving you. <laughs> Puts a whole new light to that. Your days ain't going to be long upon the land if you curse. Now, curse there, again, is probably meant threatening or uh, a death threat towards him. You made a death threat toward your parents. They say, boom, off with your head there. God protected the parents too. You see how 
there's protection for each individual through here. And as we go into verse 20 now, we're going to see, it says, uh, and if a man beats, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we missed verse 18. Go to verse 18. And if men contend with each other, they get in a big old fire, right? And one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, and he does not die, but he's uh, confined to bed, right? You're hurting bad enough. If he rises again and walks about outside with his staff, then he who struck him shall be acquitted. In other words, set free. He shall only pay for the loss of his time and shall provide for him to be thoroughly healed. Basically, he's going to have to pay the bill, pay the hospital bill, pay the, the taking care of him for that time. There wasn't hospitals, by the way, but anyway, I don't think so. Basically, God's saying you're going to give just compensation for the injury you cause. Now, today, we can see that within the laws. and It's abused, right? Man, how many commercials on TV are these accident lawyers, you know, those, those ambulance chasers, you know? Oh, I can get you more money, right? But there again, that compensation for those who are injured, again, protection for all. You know, the one, the one who did the harm had to, had to be paid. Well, he was protected too because he was only limited to that, right? He was limited in taking care of the wages this man lost and taking care of his needs. He wasn't beyond that. So it protected him and it protected the one who was harmed at the same time. In verse 20, we go on and it says, and if a man beats his male or female servant, this is kind of odd, all right? If a man beats his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. <clears throat> I hope so. Uh, notwithstanding, if he uh, remains alive, if the one you beat remains alive a day or two, uh, or two, uh, he shall not be punished, for he is his property, now it says. Hmm. You know, I had to read that 15 times to understand, well, how can that be at all just or lawful? Like I say, we've got to take things in their times. Um, fact is, this abuse of a servant, he shows two different scenarios here, right? One, they survive, and, or one, or I'm sorry, one, they're kind of, yeah, they, they're kind of survive, and the other one, they're, or they're murdered there, right? Or there's an accidental death. And if a man beats his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, boom, right then, he shall surely be punished. Now, what's that punishment? Maybe with death also, right? Maybe. Doesn't exactly say that. He shall be punished, notwithstanding if he remains alive a day or two, meaning he didn't really premeditatedly do that. It's just the man ended up dying. He says he shall not be punished. For his prop because he's his property. So I'm reading that, I'm reading that. Why wouldn't he be punished? You know, this accidental death, in essence, the master is punished because he lost. He lost a servant. What he had paid for, he lost his investment in everything. And so, it, you know, you hate to look at it that way, but a master would be careful because of this. They weren't out there to hurt their servants or hurt their slaves. And so he would have to make himself careful because you think about it, he could have a lot of investment in this person for that time. Now, now we're going to jump into something that is a passion, I, I believe it should be of Christians, and that is protection of the unborn here. Look at this. A child within the womb, God's word speaks about it. If men fight and hurt a woman with a child, right, so that she gives birth prematurely, a child within the womb, if it hurts and gives birth prematurely, yet uh, no harm follows, he shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall, uh, shall pay as the judges determine. Now, the judges make the decision how much he will pay for hurting this, this, basically, the baby, the woman and the baby. But if any harm follows then, you shall give a life for a life. In other words, if this child dies, it's a life for a life now. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, 
hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for a stripe. Amen? All life is precious to God. He even speaks about that within the womb here. Protection for all. Protection for each and every person. A per, you know, I don't, have to, I don't have to convince you that a fetus within the womb of, of, a, of a woman is a person. All right? I don't think I have to. I shouldn't have to convince you that. They are a person in God, and they're made in God's image. Amen. Simple and plain. Abortion is against God. That's all there is to it. You know, I, uh, yeah, I state that a lot of times, and I'll, I'll always stand on that, guys. I'll always stand on that as your pastor. And personally, I think there was so many wimpy pastors. I don't know what they were scared of, but, you know, when the Roe v. Wade took place, they didn't celebrate. They didn't make a celebration of it within the church and say, man, look at what God did, right? No, instead, they were going... What if I offend somebody? Are you going to stand on God's word or not? Is all life precious? Amen. And that baby within a womb is a child of God. In Genesis 1, 27, so God created man as an old image, and in the image of God, he created a male and female, and he created them. How is a man or woman created today? Within the womb, and is still a creation of God and made in his image. The fetus is in God's image. You know, those who, well, I don't know how you could ever support it personally. I want to say something, though, and you know, many ladies, maybe before they were a Christian or possibly even when they were a Christian, had an abortion. And many fathers or men, maybe before they were Christians, we're really a part of that, too. You understand, it's all covered, forgiven, forgotten, forever. You know, people that, that hold that and beat themselves up, amen? Let's go on to verse 23. Read that again. But if any harm follows, then you shall give a life for a life. Anything happens to this child, life for a life, life begins at conception, amen? No exception. That's what I say. Life begins at conception, no exception. You know, I remember growing up in, in, in science, and they, we didn't, you know, we didn't have like, well, the movies today are pornographic, right? But they would show basically what would happen when the sperm hits the egg. Guys, it's like a... It's like a nuclear bomb going off in a sense. The cell reproduction is amazing. Gosh, it's amazing what God has created there. A life for a life. You know, we in our time, we can question, and we can look at this Old Testament and say, well, what are they saying about these slaves? You know, we can question that. Oh, we can question, well, about the death penalty. Oh, the Old Testament says that, you know. Everybody wants to question that in our day and age. Wait a minute, God's laws, wait a minute, these are out of line. They're all wrong, right? They're just all wrong. Maybe that's why they question killing babies, right? Maybe that's why they say, okay, it's okay, because we can look at all these other things, well, that's got to be wrong. Well, it's not wrong to kill babies, obviously, amen? Let's go on. Protection for all, liberty for all, we get to see here. Burn for a burn, wound for a wound, stripe for a stripe. Rights for all. There again, our nation was built on it, I believe. Yet we've allowed things to, we've allowed things, well, we've allowed God to leave our country. We've allowed God, we've kicked God out, I shouldn't leave it, to kick it out. Things are getting worse and worse and worse. Church, do you see it? Do you see it? Do you hear it? Do you feel it? You know, the worst thing is, is now, it's gone far from, it's gone far from killing a child in the womb, right? It's gone much further than that. It's literally come to mutilating bodies that God has created. 
in what they call, it's guised under this, gender-affirming care. Children, children, they give puberty blockers to, Lupron, right? Causes chemical castration in boys, 12 years old. Gender, of, doesn't that sound good? Just sounds good. Gender affirming care. Cutting the breasts off of little 12 year old girls because they want them to be something different. Man, could God be just, could God be looking at us in any way but anger upon that? Seriously. In the name, they, they, in the name of protection for all, see? They put it in the name of protection for all. Doing this to these children, if we don't protect our children, where will we ever be, right? We must protect the children, the innocent. They call it, you know, individual rights. Hmm. Psalm 139, I'm going to end here. Verse 13 through 17. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I like to tell those young ones, those teenagers, those children, you're perfectly and wonderfully made, by the way, by God, just as you are. Marvelous are your works that my soul knows well. You know, that's verses saying God was there from the very beginning. He didn't make a mistake. He didn't make no mistake. God formed him perfectly and wonderfully within the womb. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, David says. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were written. The days fashioned for me when I was yet, when yet there were none of them. Verse 17, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Created in the image of God, amen. Each and every person. And God looks over each and every person and wants the protection for each and every soul. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Father, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, when we have not stood when we should stand. Forgive us, Lord, when we have not spoken when we should have spoken. Father, help us as a church to protect the innocent wherever they're at, to protect the children. Lord, to keep them from harm. Lord, to show them the love of you, Jesus. Uh, that, uh, that, Lord, you will, you will revive your church, Lord, and great things will happen. In Jesus' name, amen.